for in the newspapers. Um, one of the authors, one of Ibrahim's um, main and uh, fundamental premises in writing the letters was to let journal how many journalists do we have here by the way? Who do you add up? Not that many. Okay, not that many. All right. Was to let you know um, that your work is under scrutiny. And as such, the book also speaks to the issues of freedom of the press and the space allowed for dissenting voices. The end result is a powerful and unique offering that provides the reader with a sustained argument and narrative from the alternative perspective. Um, the quasi-controversial format that it employs also allows for incredulity and helpless horror at the injustices of the conflict <coughs> felt by so meanly and which is so keenly and properly uh, articulated. So let me just go on to, to introduce people. On my left, as I said, you've got Ibrahim uh, Hewitt. He's the senior editor of the Middle East Monitor. He is also chair and board and trustee of the British charity Interpal and is the managing trustee and he tells me at the moment the current headmaster of the uh, Al-Aqsa School in Leicester and is the contributor, al contributor to Al Jazeera, is that Al Jazeera dot net? That's here. Yeah, exactly. Yes, and is the author of a previous book called What Does Islam Say? And before I, uh, what I'll do is I'll introduce all three and then we'll come back to Ibrahim if I may. Uh, Tim Llewellyn. Have I said that right or is it Llewellyn? Llewellyn. Llewellyn. Uh, Llewellyn. Okay, well. You've got to get that, you know. Tim, who sits on my left here, <laughs> is the uh, BBC Middle East correspondent, was. or was the BBC Middle East correspondent <laughs> from 1976 to 1980. And from 1987 to 1992, not that long ago, uh, he was based in Beirut during the Civil War. Uh, he covered both the Israeli invasions in 1978 and 1982, and their aftermaths. Aftermath. He is also author of The Spirit of the Phoenix, uh, Beirut and the Story of Lebanon, uh, which was from, uh, published in 2010. And on my right is David Hurst. He's the chief, he still is the chief foreign Sweet, yeah. writer of when, the, when uh, yeah, foreign leader writer of the Guardian. And as foreign correspondent, he's covered the, he covered the loyalist backlash in the wake of the Anglo-Irish agreement in Northern Ireland, the first conflict in the breakup of the former Yugoslavia and Slovenia and Croatia, the first war in Chechnya, and the Boris Yeltsin's moral and physical decline. After Ireland, he was appointed Europe correspondent for the Guardian Europe, then joined the Moscow Brewery in 1992, before becoming Bureau Chief in 1994. He left Russia in 1997 to join the Foreign Desk and became the European editor and then the Associate Foreign Editor, Guardian. So, if I now will move <coughs> swiftly on to Ibrahim, uh, to talk about the book, why he wrote the book, uh, and uh, the messages that we can gain from the book. Okay. Rahim. Okay. Okay. Assalamu alaikum, peace be on you. Um, after a, a really splendid introduction like that, I feel a bit of a, <laughs> a fraud at times, you know, when you hear the word author splashed around, it sounds very grand. Uh, in fact, the, the book wasn't written as a book. Quite obviously, it was written as a series of letters and built up. And perhaps it could be argued that the, the failure to get those letters published uh, led to us thinking, well, it's got such a limited audience, i.e. me and the people I happen to copy it into when I send the letters off, uh, that perhaps it would be a good idea to compile them and, and put them together into this book format to try and give a, a wider audience because Quite frankly, we feel that the issues the letters raise are still issues. Although this covers the year 2009 to 2011, uh, the issues are still relevant. And, and that's a very sad fact. But I was looking this morning through some of my papers at home, and I came across something I was involved with 25 years ago as a, a colleague of 
of mine and I, we, we got together and decided to start challenging some of the media perceptions in the wake of the Salman Rushdie uh, issue here in this country. And we found very quickly that the newspapers and the media generally took more notice of us if we were writing with a title and an organization. So we created a media monitoring organization, which was just basically the two of us. And when I look back at some of those things which we reported on and, and wrote, then the issues are still the same, 25 years down the line. Only then we were talking about the occupation being uh, 40 years old, and now we're talking about it being 65 years old. So we have to ask ourselves, has anything really changed? Has what we've been able to do made a difference? Have we been able to influence anybody? Because the purpose of writing the letters has you know, a number of different focuses. We want to try and educate and you know, inform people, provide a different perspective, an alternative view. For example, today, uh, the Daily Telegraph had a big piece by Henry Winter about Roy Hodgson going to the Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem, uh, which I think is a very, very important thing to do. It's very important that we know and understand issues like the Holocaust. But I just happened to point out in a letter to the editor, I wonder if his hosts also took him across the valley to the remains of Deir Yassin, because it's just over there. It's stressing that what happened with Deir Yassin in 1948, it's an ongoing process. Houses of Palestinians are still being demolished in Jerusalem, and the residents are still being denied their residence permits from their own city and being expelled. So the ethnic cleansing, which started in 48 and 47, 48, is still going on. I've told the editors, or the letters editor, because I don't fancy that the editor of every newspaper actually sees all the letters which come in. Um, not for one minute do we think that. We used to think that. We were very naive. But I, I fancy that maybe the letters editor might take pity on me because I send the Telegraph perhaps more letters than, than uh, many of the other newspapers. And I did actually tell the, the letters editor once, I know you're not going to publish this, but I'm telling you anyway. And that's the point which Mark mentioned before. That I think it is important that the media is aware that people do read what they, they put forward. And, I've, and my brief is specifically the print media. Uh, and journalists are also aware, and I have had responses from some journalists who gives us hope that perhaps these emails are forwarded to the, the, the people who've actually written the articles to which they're relating. And this is something which I think is important that people do know. And I feel perhaps that I can take credit, in my own mind at least, for changing at least one uh, Jerusalem correspondent's view of what happened in Gaza in 2007 because we kept reading in the New York Times that Hamas seized power in 2007 and of course Hamas was the democratically elected government from 2006 and there was a, an attempted coup in 2007 now this changed after a good few letters this notion of, of seizing power was actually dropped from this particular correspondence report, which I think is a very positive thing. Because normally with the New York Times, which has actually published a couple of our letters, um, unless your name is Abraham Foxman, you're not going to get in. But he's the only person I know who's guaranteed. It's a bit like Keith Flett in this country. He's guaranteed to get a letter into The Guardian. don't know if you ever follow Keith Flett's letters in The Guardian. <coughs> I don't know if you read the letters columns of the newspaper. But I love Keith Flett. It's, it's brilliant. His letters are small, but pithy. They're really brilliant. That's the way to do it. Yeah. Change you your know, name to Keith Flett. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. no. Make it short. Make it short. Sometimes the message is longer. Yeah, yeah. Keith gets in there. But the, the, the point is that we have to try and keep this, this pressure up because the issues haven't changed, because it's very, very important. And what we've done when we've put it into the book, and I, I hope some of you will buy it, inshallah. Um, I hope lots of you will buy it. But the, the fact is that we, when I look back at it now, I see that it's actually snapshots of the main arguments in this conflict. I'm not saying it's mm. the arguments, but it actually provides a series of snapshots of the arguments, the but usual 
lines of the Ibrahim, the I, read, I read your book on the plane today. Okay. And it's absolutely what you said, snapshots. It's endorsed truth. by, can I put it on the back, a sticker on the back, endorsed by mm. Tim Levan. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's, br it's, it's brilliant. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. But, um, you know, but the problem is getting it into the newspapers isn't yeah. that easy. Yeah. The Guardian is, um, as I said, you know, you've got to make it short and witty and erupted in some way. Yeah. It's, it's, like, it's like a barrister, you know. You know you Don't blame the barristers. But I'm sure you're just a solicitor. Well, no, I'm a teacher. No, but, I'm I'm a <laughs> but you know, it's, yeah. it's, so, so it's, like it's, it's a way of getting your point across and getting it into mm. the media, mm. you know, which is important. I mean, the, the Guardian letters page, to me, I mean, quite apart from the Middle East, is, is brilliant. And, you know, it's, it's a really well it's edited. Alive. It's alive. No, it, yeah. it has humor, it has comment, it has, mm. you know, long essays from, you know, people. It's, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a very important part of the newspaper. Yeah, yeah. Should I come to you in a moment? Sorry, sorry. Sorry, it's fine. It's fine. Sorry, I'm, fine. I'm, 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 sorry, I'm Welsh. I bang on. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I mean, it, it is it is important. I actually enjoy. I, I, I read the obituary columns, so yeah, I'm, it's, I'm, I know it's very sad. But um, and any day now, enjoy. <laughs> I'll keep my eyes open. <laughs> but the, the the thing is that uh, trying to get these things across because there are perceptions in the wider world, and there are perceptions certainly. 25 years ago from uh, the pro-Israel community in this country that the media is actually pro-Palestinian and those perceptions are still there and I would argue that the complete reverse but I don't want to have a pro-Palestinian media I would just like to see a balanced media because I think it's important that people are given both sides mm. of the story there's more than one narrative going on in the Middle East at the moment there's plenty of narratives uh, I'm not saying that the the narrative which we try to put across from Middle East Monitor or the, that I try to put across in my letters is the only narrative. But what I'm trying to say is that this provides an alternative view and a different view for people then to be able to make their minds up. And I, I think this is an important aspect of living in a democracy. Sadly, for my work, not only with uh, Middle East Monitor, but with Interpol and, and all sorts of things, I mean, you know, you, you par for the course that you're labeled as an anti-Semite which I take great exception to because racism is a very evil thing. And there's a lot of racism at the moment which is directed at the Muslim community. And this is something which we all have to stand up and fight. So if anybody accuses me of being anti-Semitic, I can only believe from my track record that they're actually trying to stifle debate. And this is one of the things which has been noticeable, certainly over the last 25 years from my pers perspective, that the minute so an issue is raised, the minutes, you know, valid points are raised, the anti-Semitic uh, accusation is made in an attempt to try and close down the debate. You know, the, the messengers are, are shot with you know, appalling regularity rather than the actual issues being tackled. And I think in one small way, perhaps, I like to, you know, perhaps putting more importance on than, than it actually deserves, but I feel that in, in the, their own small way, my letters help to to try and redress that balance and to, to stand up for the voice for the people who are, in many cases, the Palestinians feeling voiceless and, and without a, a champion in the West, uh, particularly in the media, which they perceive very much to be biased towards the Israeli narrative. So that's the reason why we, you know, we put the book together. I put it to Dr. Dawood Abdullah, the director of, of Middle East Monitor, looking at Dawood. All these letters I'm sending off, um, I enjoy writing them. It's a great challenge especially when someone like the New York Times says, you know, keep it to 150 words, unless your name's Abraham Foxman of the Anti-Defamation League, mm -hmm. and he can write an essay and it's still going to get in. But, you know, keep it to 150 words to, to be able to get your point across on com complex issues within 150 words, it takes time and it's a great challenge to be able to do that. So, you know, the other thing is to, to keep this going. So, I mean, most people are not seeing these and I, I, you know, vain enough to think that perhaps they do deserve a wider audience. So, you know, I, w I would like to thank Dawood and, and uh, the colleagues at Middle East Monitor for supporting me on this. Uh, and I hope that people will enjoy reading them for a start, um, because that's what they were meant to be read. 
uh, and that we will learn something from them and possibly even be able to come back to me with counter arguments, discussions or additional points to, to raise in the future. Whichever way it is, I hope you will uh, enjoy reading it. I hope you'll buy it. If not, ask your library to buy it. Um, and thank you very much for coming this evening. And whatever questions you have, I will do my best to, to answer them at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Tim, can I come to you next um, and maybe just sort of broaden the discussion a little bit? Um, the BBC, and I know you don't speak for the BBC, um, but the BBC were heavily criticised during Operation Castlet, um, mm. particularly for its biased reporting and also for its refusal to put the emergency funding advert mm. from the disaster relief funding out there. Simple question. In your view, when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and issues, is the BBC biased? Yes. It is? Absolutely, no question about it. Discuss. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, the BBC wasn't always like this. You know, there's an old friend of mine sitting over there called David Sells. When we worked for the BBC in the 70s and the 80s, the BBC was, you know, yanny, as the Lebanese say, more or less neutral. After 2000, um, the Israelis geared up and they put so much pressure on the BBC. The BBC is now, you know, its reporting is absolutely bent. I have no doubt in saying that. You know, it's just, um, how can I say it? The way they question people, the way presenters in, you know, interpret people. The, the number of times Israelis get on the air, Mark Regev is on the air, you know, it, it's unbelievable how bent the, Israel, the, the BBC is at the moment. And I've, I know, I've, I can't say it because I know people, <coughs> you know, I can't be a whistleblower. I know, I know one or two correspondents and they've told me, you know, the pressure is on them all the time, always to caveat. Um, a report about the Palestinians to caveat it. In other words, you know, the Palestinians had a bad time today, but the Israelis also had a, you know. And you can see it. I, mean, I you know, I, could, I used to do this. I didn't do it that way, but I used to do this. You know, I, I know how these guys feed in that sort of um, replicant um, piece of. Hey, okay, we, we were bad to the Palestinians, but the Israelis also had a bad time. So that's one thing. But the other thing which I think is more important um, <coughs> is what I call corrective context. And this is one of the things that, um, I don't know whether you read Greg Philo's book about, uh, Greg Philo is, you know, is a friend of mine and they did, they did a massive piece of research about the way that the, the first years of the second intifada were covered. You know, they, they examined it in terms of language, in terms of the way you described things, you know, the way of everything was, um, you know, uh, I don't know, sort of, sort of objectified in some way. These are people like us. You know, the Israelis are people like us. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, they drive to the supermarket. They, <coughs> you know, there's a sort of natural instinct there. But, you know, the, the way the BBC started to report this in, in, in the early 2000s completely changed from what it used to do. And I mean it. And I watched it. And then we examined it and we analyzed it. You know, it, it's, it's, it's just dreadful that the, the attitude is that, I don't know, it, it's, it's very hard to describe, you, you know, you don't know where it comes from. Is it coming out of some sort of racist bias or some sort of idea that, you know, this isn't the outfit that I used to work for. And, and um, bringing it back now to... to but con it. Sorry, I'm... No, I'm, no, fine. No, I want to finish my point. Okay, no. No, context. 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 Corrective context. Yes. 
You know, when the Israelis bomb Gaza, it's the BBC always says in response to a Palestinian rocket. Now you have to th imagine that Palestinian rocket going to Sederot, which is a former village. Nobody ever says that. Nice. Yeah. You know, I'm okay. It's bad. They sh they shouldn't do it. They're, they're idiots. You know, they fire a rocket at Sederot, or, or you know, or, or somewhere in the. You know, the next, the next thing the Israelis are, are using the weapons of war against these people. You know, the Palestinians are, you know, are, are not an army. You know, and I, I'm not pro-Palestinian. I'm looking at it from a human rights thing. You know, these people are being punished. You know, nobody knows in this country that there's a ring around the Gaza Strip. You know, which, which is a free fire zone. Any little boy goes in chasing a football. You see, the problem is, I think, for the. Sorry, I'm going to. No, no, no. Go I'm go, you I'm can't go, finish your point because I want to. I'm going to bring so, you back. Yeah, okay. I mean, I think the problem is, you know, in any all these cases, is that um, it's very hard to report a war like this, a relentless war, a relentless struggle. You know. I mean, we all want sort of dynamite moments, you know, massacres, lots of people killed, Syrian, you know, Paul Woods goes into marvelous. But um, the Palestinian case is just day by day, it's relentless. These people are being cheated of their lives. And the BBC doesn't have the ability to get it across. And, and that's why I'm going to now bring you back to Ibrahim's book, actually. And you said you read it on the plane over, and, and you you were having you were making brief comments. I wonder if you could continue on that and and tell us what you thought of the book and what you took away from the book. Look, the, well, I mean, then you have to ask yourself another question, which I think is a deeper question: Why is it like this? Why does the BBC not report it properly? Is it a sinister conspiracy? Is it a, you know, is it a lazy way of, you know, looking at, <coughs> you know, the fact that, um, that the Israeli lobby is very powerful in all three of our main political parties? Is it the BBC being very fearful? I mean, the Guardian is able to do it in a different way because the Guardian can put, um, different points of view all the time. You know, one day you have Netanyahu, the next day you have um, uh, Seamus Mill, the next day... It, it's, a, it's a balancing act. You know, the newspaper can do a balancing act, but the BBC can't do that. You know, it's, it's a relentless thing that keeps coming out all the time. And, and the, uh, can you hear at the back there, by the way? You can hold here. Thank you. So, so can you... Yes, he is, isn't he? Can you, you need to just... Sorry. No, sorry, no. Yes, so it's my fault. I should have taken you away from the. Away no, from I'm, I, you know, I, I get very upset about this. Correct yes. this context. You know, the Palestinians didn't start the 2008 war. The Israelis started it. It's absolutely definitive. The Guardian reported it. You know, in November 2008, the, the Palestinians were observing a ceasefire. Israelis broke it. They came in, they murdered two people. You know, what? So, I mean, but the, 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 the Western press never reported it that way. It's always the other way around. I think I, I should yield my uh, position to David. As Hurst. you mentioned, The Guardian, I'll turn around. All right. Well, the Guardian is, you know, I mean, The Guardian, of course, is, you know, is a liberal paper. And in a sense, I think, you know, mostly you're preaching to, to the converted. Like I might be in this room. You know, it's, it's, it's getting other people, you know, the Guardian readers aren't Daily Mail readers, you know. How do you get hold of them? Well, I'm so prepared. There you go, there you go. <laughs> um, possibly not that it's relevant. I mean, I think, you know, Tim has got incredible experience and he speaks with real power which I don't. I don't have experience of the Middle East. Uh, I'm just a leader writer. 
I have experience of other parts of the world, but actually not in that sort of sense. And what he's saying is absolutely true. Uh, not to say that you know the Guardian is immune from pressure at all, but just in my short time as leader writer, I've felt that pressure very, very personally, both within and outside the organisation. But how? Denounced. Denounced on the internet as a self-hating Jew, which I'm not. Uh, you know, if you just Google my name, you'll see there's a whole organisation that is just basically there to monitor every single thing I write uh, from the point of view of anti-Semitism or this or that and the other. You know, I, the whole thing is disgusting. Um, and, uh, uh, but it's pressure, it really mm. is pressure. And if you actually, you know, talk to uh, the Israeli press attaché, they basically admit that the two real enemies of Israel are the BBC and the Guardian. I mean, they absolutely say it completely openly. Is so that, that the independent? Well, a and the independent, but the p particularly, p particularly those two, but the independent absolutely as well uh, comes out, you know. And they regard London, you know, they're, they're the ones that call London Londonistan. Uh, uh, they are the ones that say that, uh, I mean, that, that there is this absolutely whole uh, um, idea that somehow they're in enemy territory. Um, and so the first thing, the first thing I really want to say is that absolutely the way Tim described it, when you write about the subject or when you broach about the subject, you are aware that immediately you are doing the equivalent of kicking a, a wasp's nest all the time. Bang. Mm. Out it comes. I mean, literally every single moment you do it. And what you've got to do is steal yourself and say, right, I'm going to get stung here, but it's worth it. You've, you've got to do it as duty as a journalist. You actually have to, you, you have to put yourself uh, in, in that process. And there are people that resist it, and there are people who do it very well, and there are people who, are, who, who don't. I mean, one of the people I'd like to cite, again, I don't want to make this some sort of uh, you know, love fest for The Guardian, but I think one particularly brave journalist was a former colleague of mine, Chris McGreal, who wrote 16,000 yeah, 16, words, basically, when he when he'd left Israel, but you know, came back and whatever, uh, on this whole uh, subject of, of to what extent Israel is like an apartheid state. And this, is a, this was an exceptionally brave guy who was a superb Africa correspondent as well. And he really knew South Africa, he really knew Africa, uh, and then later he was ready to know Israel. Um, and it was brave because I think it, it, uh, he knew exactly what was going to happen. And, it, and, it, and it, every single word of that was basically referred to the press council by the, the, you had streams of lawyers attacking it and he defended it and he, and, and not one single of something like tens or fifteen claims to the press council won. But you have to do that, you have to be, you have to have that, that complete and utter, uh, almost like Rottweiler um, approach to the facts and you've got to stick at it. Um, so. That's one thing that sort of, it makes you almost sort of obsessive. But that's one thing I think you have to have if you're actually covering the error. You mustn't be pushed off your turf. And you must absolutely uh, measure your facts. And w this is why Ibrahim's book, the unpublished book, of, published book of unpublished letters, is so valuable. Because uh, if you read it, this is exactly what we have all been doing. I mean, uh, I can mention quite a few other examples other than the seizure of Gaza. The seizure of Gaza is an interesting one because, A, there was an election there, the first democratically held election mm. in the Arab world, which Hamas, unfortunately, from a lot of people won, but they won it, and they won it fairly, and it was, a, and, and, and it was the wrong man won, but they won it. Um, and also because you can't really talk about what happened uh, a year later without also mentioning that a, a faction of Fatah, not the whole of it, but one that was backed by the CIA and by Israel, tried to do exactly the same thing. You can't describe a war with one or what happened in Gaza at that time without actually describing one of the combatants. But that's what happens. It's as if they weren't fighting against anybody. Uh, the siege of Gaza, for instance, um, started with the Hamas military takeover. No, it didn't. Uh, it started about a year before it, when crates of tomatoes were left rotting on, 
on the border. Um, commandos landing on the Madi Mavra, this is when mm. I was writing about it, were attacked. They didn't do the attacking. Um, uh, this was a ship belonging to Turkey, uh, 40 miles inside international waters. Settlements are not settlements, they're new neighborhoods. New neighborhoods of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is not Jerusalem, it goes all the way up to Bethlehem. And you can just carry on and on and on and on. And each and every blow of this battle sparks its own secondary war of words. Uh, and I would argue that this has a strategic as well as a tactical view. It makes journalists defensive. Uh, most editors wilt under pressure and uh, prefer to avoid that sort of pressure altogether. Mm, interesting. You say that, but why? Why do they will? I mean, what is the pressure? I mean, you know, it's a very important phrase you just said. Most editors wilt under pressure. Now, is it because, you know, I can see it in the BBC, they're fright, you know, these people are quite aggressive, right? The Jewish lobby is not much fun. No. And they come at you from every direction, you know. It's a pro Israel. Yeah, if, you, if, you, if you're, I mean, that's very important to say you're that Jewish, it's, not, right? it's not a Jewish lobby. So it's pro Israel. Can I, can I interrupt? Can I interrupt a second? It's not a Jewish lobby. It may be a Zionist lobby. It might be a pro-Israel pro lobby. Yeah, but they use the Jewish connection to, to get yes, you. Yes, but it's not necessarily a, a Jewish lobby. Right, it's I mean, an Israeli. Oh, it's Israel. Friends of Israel. Let's, yes. let's, let's, not, let's not be too polite about them because they're not very polite about us. Right? Yeah, but they're not now, our teachers. But why no. are we afraid of them? That's what I don't understand. You know, I mean, I'm, you know, we're all British. <coughs> It what, you, I mean, you know what? What is it? it? What, well. what can this guy do? To <laughs> what? It requires. It, I'm it, British. It, I'm you know. I'm a, I may be Welsh, but I'm. What, 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 I think. Sorry. I think it requires quite a lot of persistence. It it, it, it requires a completely unshakable uh, preparation. I think there's there there is. I mean, this is an apolitical answer, but I think it's a real one in terms of news. For me, it requires a lot of energy. And people don't have that energy. People don't want the fight. Uh, it's not particularly productive in news terms. <coughs> um, and they want to move on to the next subject. That's not a very clear answer. But I mean, it's a real one. It's what actually no, but it's happens. A, but David, that sounds a bit wimpy to me. I, mean, I know, I know, I know, I, I absolutely. And I don't do it. But I mean, I just see it around me all the time. I mean, you and know, there's you know, as I said before, the Guardian. Because it's a newspaper, it's got, it, it can do spreadsheet. It can do. It can do Seamus Mill one day. It can do Jonathan Friedland, soft Zionist the other. You know, it's 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 it's, it's a kind of matrix. Well, the BBC it, can't do that. The BBC is a linear organisation. It requires okay. A, a, another an, uh, maybe this is a better uh, way. It requires strong editors. But they are, they and it requires are editors to back you up. And it requires them. strong editors. By the, 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 but the editors themselves and the, and the structure, which is, aren't necessarily former foreign correspondents, at least not in the Guardian, and uh, and it requires quite a lot of knowledge, and it requires that investment of time, and and although. We, this is a tremendously important subject to everyone in the room and to us. Mm. When the spotlight of the sensationalist spotlight moves onto another sensation, mm. so, so, so does that experience, so does that collective knowledge. Can and that's I, not, that also is not a terribly satisfactory answer. Can, can I ask this question? Ibrahim mentioned the, the, the issue of um, taking a balanced approach. Now, I, I have concern with a balanced approach because it's not a balanced situation. So if you take a balanced approach to a non-balanced situation, then actually you get a distorted view which is totally biased to, to in this case, Palestine. Do you, do you agree with that, that view? I mean, can you take a balanced approach? Can you do the balanced reporting that the BBC has seemed to be so proud of nowadays? I, I think the whole notion of balance has to be really carefully thought about because what you associate with balance is symmetry. Um, you know, even if you can't agree on what has actually happened, you're left with the impression that, well, it's one unreasonable side against another unreasonable side. Neither of them can agree. They both, there isn't sort of an equality of fault about them. Whereas, in fact, there is, as Tim knows, a deep asymmetry to both the debate that's going on and to actually what's happening on the ground. Every year that you do not get 
a peace negotiation or, 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 or a settlement. It's another year in which Palestine shrinks. I mean, literally shrinks mm. before your eyes. It's another idea where you have twinkling lights all over the West Bank, all with Israeli settlements that weren't there the last time you walked on it. You can literally feel the space shrinking. Um, can can, can, I, can, can I, I come back to the yes. yes. I know very clearly, obviously, that the, That's a very the good conflict point. is completely asymmetric. Mm. What I'm thinking is that when we have the debate, which is asymmetric also, I think there's a need for this to have balance. To let people make up their own minds, because to me, once people have both narratives, then it's it's very obvious to me which way people are going to to go, and and, and so on. So that I'm not saying that you know you, the the balance is is balanced out on the uh, the actual conflict, right. political level and the military level and whatever. It's completely asymmetric. I mean, you know, when you hear about the Gaza war, it wasn't a war. Even the you know the, the Americans were described as a turkey shoot. And so it's it's something like this which is, is very uh, important to understand. It's the it's the debate which is not happening at the moment, really, which has to be put forward in a balanced way to let people make up their own mind. That's the whole idea of a debate. Yes. And can can I ask you, Tim? Did, did you feel? Did did you? Did you? Will you go back to? Well, no, 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 that's fine. No, okay, don't worry. Are sorry. you sure? No, you, go on, go on. No, sorry. I was going to say, did, did you? I mean, when you were working for the BBC. Mm. Did anyone ever put you under any pressure, both at the BBC or outside the BBC, to report in a certain way no. in relation to Middle East? Absolutely not. No. I mean, I can, I can say, I had one experience. It was uh, 1989, when uh, the Israelis went into the Al-Aqsa uh, Al Mosque <laughs> and I, I report, you know, they, 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 they were shooting into the, the, this is the first intifada. And I had a phone call from a guy who I, you know, I, I like and respect. He said, Tim, he said, he said, did they really fire into the mosque? And I said, yeah, I saw it. You know, and he said, could you put in the Israeli apology? I mean, could you, the Israeli denial, sorry, in, in, in the middle of your piece? I said, uh-uh, no way. If they want to deny it, they can deny it. That's, that's, it's their right. And you know, I've never disputed the Israelis' right to push their case, to make their case. That's, that's you know, you know, that was the only time I ever had any now, I don't know what ever happened behind the scenes. You know, sometimes stories probably got dropped. I'm, but I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist about it. I never had any uh, direct experience of being... And the thing was very different, you know, then. Between 1975 and 19, uh, 1990, you know, the, um, we were able to report there's a what whole was going on. There was a whole program yeah. dropped a few mm -hmm. weeks ago. No, I'm not even lying. There was a whole program dropped about. Uh, yes. This year no, so I mean, there's yes. something sinister going on now. I mean, there's yes. they, they dropped a program about um, archaeological the, the archaeological yeah. thing, yes. and, and then we never got a nice answer, did we? It, they, it was a bullshit answer. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's, it's a friend of mine. She, she knows more about this than I do. They said they dropped it because they didn't fit into schedule. Yeah. And you knew it was, I mean. D David, I, I interrupted you and you were about to say something, so should I come back to you now? Well, no, yeah, it's, 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 it's just that we've, um, we've talked about the, the past. Um, if you look ahead and see well, how the media is going to cover the future, I just wanted to say just a few words about that, but I mean, it's not... No, no, please do. Maybe directly relevant to the, to the book. There's this, you know, there's this whole play on the word of urgency, the urgency for a... Uh, a solution, the urgency for talks, and Bert, Alistair Bert, who's the uh, Foreign Officer Minister, is in Ramallah today, or was in Ramallah today. Um, and, um, you know, the peace process has variously been described as moribund, um, as on life support, or as dead. Um, I, I think of it as dead, but I'm not allowed to write that. Um, uh, 
See, that's another thing. You know, why aren't you allowed to write that? That was my question. I was about to say that. <laughs> <laughs> because at the moment, uh, the Guardian supports a two-state solution. The Guardian supports the, the Guardian supports two-state solution. You see, and you see, this is. I'm sorry. But, I mean, I, you know, I. I really like you. I think you're a very bright guy. <laughs> and I know you're under a lot of... Before I criticize you, I just want to tell you how wonderful you are. No, but, I, but, 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 you know, this is, the, this is the fundamental question. Why aren't we allowed to say the two-state solution is dead in the water? Al Haaretz says it every day. It's, fin it's finished. But we have to... No, the Guardian's not a... It's, the BBC, you could say, okay, the BBC is part of the government. I mean, we, we're paid by the government. You pay. All of you pay, by the way. You pay for the bullshit, the BBC. <laughs> but but, but it, it's part of the government system. The Guardian's an independent newspaper. It's a, it's a trust. That's, that's, why, that's, why, that's why, 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 why does the Guardian have to, to be... That's, actually one, of the, that's actually one of the paradoxes of the whole thing, that the media in Israel is often more lively and mm. robust on this issue than the media mm. in the so-called diaspora in, in New York and you know, in, in Europe. And that's one of the paradoxes. Have they published any of your letters in Israel? <laughs> um, given it, that I'm Hebrew actually banned in good. Israel it's because of my work <laughs> with uh, Interpol and the Palestinian Relief Fund, I'm not allowed to go to Israel. I wouldn't imagine that they've published Brahim, it. Uh, 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 Brahim, you, uh, should, you should learn to write Yiddish. You know, you get it. Hebrew. 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 Yeah. Yes. No, Yiddish. Yiddish. I have enough problems with English better. now. Well, what I want to what I want to do majority. what I want to do at this stage, if I may, is open it up for some questions um, from the audience. I'm sure there are going to be many questions. So, um, could I ask if you're from an organisation that you tell us, but if you're not, just your name will do. <laughs> <laughs> so, hands up. It should be. Oh, there you go. Thank you. My name's Kate Fick. Um, you can't be doing everything wrong because in a recent BBC poll, I heard that the Israel is the least popular country. So you must be saying something right. So, so are you saying from that? Are you saying therefore the reporting? in some counts, must be quite balanced and must be in, in, in uh, giving a true reflection of Israel. And and even and would you say that that's because because of the media or, or because of other things? We also got to include social media into this now, haven't we? I think there's there's certainly been a sea change in that you, you do see and hear things in the media which you even ten years ago you wouldn't have wouldn't have read or seen on television. Um, so I think there has been a sea change. Quite whether it's the media driving this or is it the public driving this uh, or the politicians, I, I, it's hard to tell. I think it's probably a mix of all, but the, certainly the, you know, the, the new media have played, has played a role in that. Have played a role? Has played a role. Um, it's, it's something which is, is there and it's, it's more accessible and more people are aware of this. But uh, it's in terms of formalizing, I think there has been a, a strong sea change you see articles now, uh, which you know you think, "Whoa, you know, you'd never ever ten years ago have seen them seen them published." Uh, and say it's using words, using terminology. So you, you see, it's, it's, you see the tide turning, or I th I think so. I think yes. so. Yeah, I'm an optimist. I've got to. Okay. There was a hand up at the back there, the top, the yellow top. Hi, um, I'm Jill Swain. I'm a former Fleet Street journalist and I now edit um, Palestine News magazine. I just wanted to say really that um, I think one of the difficulties for journalists is that the Israelis have controlled the narrative to such a degree that uh, the general view still of most people in this country is that Israel's a little guy and the, they're surrounded by potential, you know, people who want to wipe them off the map and that uh, all the Palestinians are potential terrorists and, and so on and so forth. And it would, it would require uh, a lot of coverage, in particular in the sort of mass right-wing, which is mostly right-wing press, 
to really get the, uh, the true situation over. So what the journalists are actually working in the context of um, the reality is so very different from what most ordinary people who are not particularly well informed think the situation is, that it's like if you write the truth, it's, it, you know, it, it, it won't be believed because it's so very different from, from what they're but you the know, thing in their mind is so. But can I add? So uh, can I, uh, can just I add to finish the point? It can be very brief. It, no, no, but uh, I mean, but I yeah. agree with what you're saying. But you know, I'll, I, I come, I'll come back to you in a moment just to answer the point. But but if you can just finish it off and then uh, you can come back I, yeah. To you well, too. I just want to finish off because I do think yes. this is changing, and I've based up. I've just mm. been to um, the West Bank recently and read quite a few pieces in the Jerusalem papers in which they are addressing the fact that they're losing control of the narrative and, and it's changing to uh, the Palestinians being seen as victims now instead of the Israelis and things like that. So yeah. I think it is changing probably because of social media rather than... So, so you want to say something too? No, right? I mean, I mean, <coughs> I mean uh, the two studies came out. Memo did one about the, the, you know, the European Union view of Israel, which is, I mean, this is a personal thing. You know, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a study done in 2002, I think, wasn't it? And you know, the 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 the, the, the thinking in Europe was not anti-Israel, but trying to get things, you know, right. And then we did. Then there was another one in what 2008. You know. And, and I know the British I public opinion has, has changed. And, uh, and if you go, if you if you actually, you know, go around um, like I do, being English, I go around my villages. My, people are very, you know, they're very pro-Palestinian. They don't like what's going on. In Not because they are anti-Israeli, because they think it's wrong. You know, it's a sort of, you know, it's, a, it's an injustice going on there. You know, I mean. It never, the BBC never describes this thing the way it is. People are pinching land at gunpoint day by day. I mean, it's as simple as that. I think, David, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. I also think there's another dynamic going on, certainly in, 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 the, in, the, in the last recent period. And that is that the Palestinians who are supposed to be talking aren't talking, and the Palestinians who are supposed to be fighting aren't fighting. And what that leaves you with is actually the reality of the occupation, day by day by day. And that and that, and that, without the rockets, and, uh, and and that actually is important because it actually concentrates your focuses your mind on what the underground, the underlying um, statistics are all about. And I never have these statistics in my head, but it is interesting each time you go back to square one in the peace process to find out actually what has changed since then, how much land has been lost, how many settlements have been built. Uh, how many people have been kicked out of their homes? What's happened? And the figures are staggering. Mm. It's just like it's it's like the figures of Palestinian deaths that are just that seem to be to seem to go on and on and on and on, and they don't even rise into the they don't they don't even get into the news headlines. You know, a kid shop or something like that. Yes, you know, it's just, it just doesn't it, it doesn't emerge, and that is just daily life. On that, on that statistic, I mean, I've got it in my head because I just did something about it last week. There's one Palestinian child, minor being shot dead by the Israelis every three days for the last 13 years on average. That's the statistic. Now if, imagine if that was happening the other way around or if it was some, a child here being killed violently every three days for 13 years, something would be done about it. But with, if I just raised the issue about the, for, for journalists, I understand this, the position because the spokesmen, spokeswomen for the Israelis are very fluent in English, they're very presentable, they're very slick. <laughs> Whereas for the Palestinian side, they're not. That's putting it nicely. Um, and it's, uh, part of that is down to the culture. And I, I, I raise this a lot of the time because the, you know, you, if you watch any Arab news program, the presenter will ask a question and then he can go away, put the kettle on, make himself a cup of tea, come back, and the guy's still giving an answer. And it's, it's, the question is a sort of a, a prompt for a lecture. They haven't got this perception of you know, a 30 second sound bite. And so it's a completely different culture in that sense. And for a journalist, particularly, that must be frustrating. And so the easy route out is to, to you know, get Mark Regev on because he's, he's slick and get him on there. And that's the easy way around it. So is, is, is it lazy journalism? Can I come to this? Sorry. Is it 
Brooke, do you want to wait for the mic? Although you've got a very strong voice, we'll wait for the mic to come your way. Is it going to be a question? Uh, uh, well, it's an answer to the question, a point which was raised that one of the reasons why Israel has got a worse press is the present Israeli government, because they come out absolutely straight, and one of the coalition members who calls himself Jerusalem Home, and he's an internet multimillionaire, everybody ought to remember who it is. Anyway, the present coalition does not do anything to make themselves, ingratiate themselves to the world at large. And also, they APAC, America's Jewish Israeli lobby, they are so well organized. And I mean, we're all too nice, whether we're the Palestinians or the British, or we aren't awfully nice, but you know, we, as you say, go and make a cup of tea. They don't make cups of tea. They get, and they are desperately tough. Uh, what is it? Moses said that they were hard necked people. They are. And they are so well organized. And I mean, if nobody sees that they're going to take over the oh, entire I'm form gonna, of I'm Palestine, I mean, they are. This is I'm their agenda. I'm going to cut you short because I, what I want to do is I want to get some questions for the panel. No, no, no. No, oh, right, now you're leaving. Um, <laughs> hope it wasn't me. <laughs> okay, questions. Lady in the blue dress. And then I'm going to come to a man. <laughs> Hello, um, Hello, Isabella Scott. <laughs> Um, one of the questions that was posed that was really interesting was about balanced reporting and it's a kind of a philosophical question whether you can report in a balanced way and whether it's appropriate and one of the issues um, I think could be that um, when you choose which statistics that you refer to you, you do almost immediately pick a side because you have Palestinian statistics and you have Israeli statistics and Palestinian facts and Israeli facts because they come from various sources and I wondered whether uh, how the BBC and how the Guardian perhaps deal with those kind of questions. I mean, obviously there's facts of, you know, dates which can be more specific, but in, I, in terms of... I disagree with that. You disagree, okay. I could disagree. There's some great Israeli statistics Bet and there's Salem. some great Israeli organisations like Bet Salem yeah. uh, and a whole bunch of people who are prepared to stick their neck on the line. There's some great stuff being done um, uh, in the Negev, uh, there's in South Hebron, about a whole variety of issues. Now the information's out there, it's a question of who says it. If the BBC says what's in Haaretz, for instance, there'll be a riot. I mean, uh, it, the stuff is out there, and it's in Israel as well. It's a question of whether the, whether the BBC or the Guardian can actually say it. I mean, oh, it's just the, the, I, I mean, out of interest for him, I mean, where, where do you get your sources of information from? That, that statistic about the children was from the Beit Salem, mm -hmm. the Israeli human rights organisation, uh, from their website. But you know, you don't need to get any information from anywhere in Israel. Let go there. I mean, I can w I could go tomorrow uh, to Jerusalem. <laughs> and walk down into 50 yards from the, the American colony where Tony Blair lives, right? Used to. And watch an Arab family being kicked out. You know, I mean, and you can get, you, I, I used to drive, even when I was I, I wanna, long since. I, I do want to get some more, some more questions, but maybe yeah, part yeah. of what you say. No, but I mean, you can go every, Israel is a free country. I mean, go there go and see it. As a as a as a important. I have yeah. been there, I've seen it and it changed my my life mm. and my experience as well. Questions. Uh, the man in the blue shirt at the front here. Hi. <coughs> oh, my name's Matthew. No organizational affiliation. Uh, we had the beginnings of what I thought was quite an interesting disagreement a bit earlier. So um, Tim, I think you said that unequivocally in your view the BBC is biased in its reporting. Uh, David, I think you said, sort of told us comments which you've heard elsewhere, which is the BBC is kind of number one enemy or number two enemy or a major enemy of the Israeli state. My question is, I guess, to Ibrahim directly, um, for the for the balanced view, BBC biased or not biased? <laughs> um, I think there are certain sections of the BBC which are, are very clearly biased. Uh, looking at the output, and looking at the input and looking at who's behind it. Um, and I, I, I would love to be proved wrong. But the, what I've seen is that, it's, in my opinion, there is biased reporting from the BBC. Can, can, I, can I ask a follow-up question? Is it biased because of lazy journalism or biased due to people who have a very set opinion 
be it pro-Israeli. <laughs> well, so I think no, 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 I'm just going to ask Ibrahim. So sorry, sorry. sorry. Um, I think it's it's both. I, I know I'm sitting on I the can't fence there. This stuff, yeah. <laughs> I, I, it's both. I think there is lazy journalism. Part of the reasons that I said, it's easier to get a straight answer out of Mark Ragev than it is out of a Palestinian Authority spokesman. Simple as that. And if you're on you know, the Today program uh, and you're, you're not asking the questions you should be asking because you, know, you, you don't ask the questions you're supposed to ask because it's going to provide uncomfortable answers, perhaps. I mean, I then, you know, yeah. sorry, Tim. Yeah. Um, then you know that something's, something's wrong somewhere. I'm going to go uh, back uh, out there, Tim, because I, wanna, I, wanna, I really want to take some more questions. You can see lots of hands coming up. The man with the beard at the back, that's you looking behind your shoulder. No, that's you, definitely you. <laughs> um, hi there, my name's Nick. I'm just a concerned member of the public. Um, I have two questions. First off is regarding The Guardian, which is obviously seen as the more liberal sort of viewpoint within the UK. I'd specifically like to ask a question concerning the capture of the corporate Gilad Shalit and his release afterwards. Most of the Western media's reporting on this, including The Guardian's, was was that the conflict which arose out of that started off with the Hamas capture of Gilad Shalit. Yet, following this, Noam Chomsky has been publicly known to state that that was not the starting events, but were the starting events happened a few days prior, which um, involved the kidnapping of certain members of the Palestinian community. Um, I have never seen anything from The Guardian along these lines. In fact, all of the reporting surrounding um, Gilad Shalit, his release, etc., was specifically centric around the release of this one man. There was very little written about the release of the 1,000 political prisoners um, from Palestine, most of which who were simply members of the community, they were members of the public, whereas obviously Gilad Shalit was a member of the IDF. You know, he was in a position of risk. And I did not see this coming from The Guardian, which is, you know, as we've said, is meant to be our, our liberal spokesperson. So I would like to sort of challenge that view with that. And then also concerning the BBC, I would like to ask how it was seen to be acceptable from A, the British public, and B, members of the BBC, for Mark Thompson to openly go and speak to Ariel Sharon and have a private meeting with Ariel Sharon and nothing at all of the opposite. Where there was no meetings at all with any Palestinian authorities at all. I, I'll come to you first, David. Um, okay, right. Well, first thing is I'm, I'm, I'm not the Jerusalem, co I'm not the Middle East correspondent. Uh, I write the leaders. And so I'm not in a position to say why it is that other narratives were taken out. There's a genuine difficulty about where anything starts. And, that's, and, 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 and in any big uh, conflagration, particularly, uh, particularly in the Middle East, it's very, very difficult to know where the starting point is. And you can go back and back and back. It's like the exchange of missiles or, or whatever. That is difficult in its own right. From memory, I think you're wrong about the, uh, the, the fact that the Guardian did not uh, produce any uh, information about who was being exchanged, because I read it. Um, and, and we went way into the, the actual prisoner exchange. But you're right in the sense that this is not, this is a very, very fallible process. Um, and Chomsky is right. Uh, in picking us up and taking us to task. And, and you're right to do the same thing as well. There's always going to be uh, mistakes that, that, either mistakes that creep in, or this sort of limited context that distorts, that distorts views. So, Mark Thompson, could you, you know, him? I, yeah, I would like to, you know, there's, there's something else that troubles me about all this. Um, and going back to Shelley, you know, is, is that it's, we talk about the Jewish lobby, the Israeli lobby, the Friends of Israel. There is this people like us thing. You know, Shalit was a, was a person like us. He was Western, in a way. And that's the way the Western media responds. This guy was like normal. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a repulsive thing to have to say, but he was we could relate better to him. We, 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 we relate, you know, he, he goes to Waitrose and, you know, he drives a Volkswagen. Yeah. So, yeah. But, you know, 
But what about and, 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 and that's that's why the guy um, was was um, made a hero. Yes. What, he was what, he was what, a person PLU, a person like us, and that's I think one of the fundamental things about Israel. The Europeans have made the Israelis people like us. But we're coming back you know, to the, so, the, so the we actual, all identify the, with the actual them. question in relation to Mark Thompson. Do you think you're in a position to ask? position in relation to criticism towards him and the meeting that he took place in Israel, particularly just after Operation Cast Lead? I think it was a very bad move. I did think you want to, sorry, no, sorry David, did you, you were going to come in and say something? I just going to say one of the things which was missing in most coverage of the Shalit case was the fact that he was a serving soldier, part of a military mm. occupation, when he was captured. And that was missing. It was as if he was kidnapped like anybody else was kidnapped. You know, like the, in Lebanon in the 80s when the, the guys were kidnapped. It was almost as if it was like that, and it wasn't like that. He was a serving soldier as part of a military occupation. Uh, of course, the, 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 the BBC themselves suffered from um, uh, kidnapping Gaza as well. Yeah. Alan, Alan Johnson. Johnson. Alan Johnson. Yeah. I, I, mean, I, I wasn't disagreeing with Tim earlier on. I, I was really trying to say that I think there's a lot of targeting going on, uh, targeting of senior executives. Uh, and by who? By 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 the Israeli embassy. Yeah, targeting in the sense that there's absolute lobbying going on and saying uh, 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 this is wrong, that's wrong. We challenge this, we challenge that, and there's a huge amount of pressure brought to bear because the BBC is uh, acts on behalf of the licensed free pair. There's the, there's a huge amount of pressure brought on the Guardian in different ways, but we're an independent organisation. But, um, and, you, and you've just said a lot, a lot of words there, which um, I think you should explain. You know, the, the BBC is pressured because it's part of a governmental system. And, you know, yeah. There's no question about the Friends of Israel are big in the, each three political parties, right? And the BBC, having been crushed by, um, you know, in, in, in 2004, it, your, your point to David was what, what, is that I think the BBC has been crushed. I mean, right. I, I, I think, but I don't see you know because it's a it's 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 a quasi governmental system. The BBC, you know, it's a tax. You know, we pay. Yes. But the Guardian isn't. The Guardian is a you know should be free. Well, can we come yeah. back to the independence of the Guardian in a moment? Because I do want to come out and ask some more questions. Um, the gentleman right at the back. And then I'll come to you. I know uh, you had your hand up for a while. I'll come back to you. Uh, yes, uh, Paul Hugh Smith. I, I'd like your comments about reporting uh, a long uh, ongoing conflict. Um, I recently talked to a World Service BBC journalist who was being retrained for television, he said. And, um, he, and I asked him, you know, about what we're discussing now and why the BBC fail to give context and uh, talk more about the Palestinian issues. And he said, well, we're, we're generally told that, uh, you know, uh, in, in, unless it involves violence and uh, rockets and uh, uh, that, that any, anything else like background information uh, is, is now you know, that people on will not be interested in, mm. in, in such things. Um, that there's a, there's a kind of a perception of media fatigue. Mm -hmm. So I wondered what uh, you, you felt about that be kind be of... Before issue. I put that over to the panel, I wonder if I'd come down actually and, and take two more questions, if I may, from down the front here. Um, questions, but if they, if they are statements, very short. Yes, um, it is a question I just, um, for Ibrahim and for David, I can just lead into it. My name is Armin. I work for Palestine Solidarity Campaign, and my job is to monitor the BBC and also challenge it. And if I could give um, just a couple of examples to illustrate what I want to ask, um, in terms of Jerusalem, the program that you were talking about that was pulled, it was going. The evidence that they uncovered was uh, going to question the scale of the Jewish exile from Jeru Jerusalem in 70 AD. Um, it was going to question whether it actually happened, and it was widely publicised by the BBC and then it was pulled at the 11th hour um, and the, do the documentary maker has said that it w there was a case of political pressure put on the BBC, said it was either conscious or subconscious but there was definitely political pressure there 
Um, also in terms of Jerusalem, the BBC regularly refers to Jerusalem in its entirety as an Israeli city. And I've challenged this again and again, and the BBC senior editorial strategy advisor has come back to me and said that because um, Israel administers Jerusalem politically, military, and administratively as well, um, as, a, as an entirety and makes no distinction between East Jerusalem and West Jerusalem, the BBC sees no reason to make that distinction as well. Um, and then finally, um, you mentioned Palestinian interviewees. There are actually a lot of uh, you know, Palestinians who speak perfect English who are able to um, you know, be interviewed very, very well on the BBC, but they're not allowed to state their point. Most recently on the Today programme, John Humphreys interviewed Garda Kami, um, and he also interviewed at the same time Toby Green from BICOM about the Stephen Hawking boycott. He interrupted Garda Kami five times uh, while he was interviewing her. He didn't interrupt Toby Green once. Um, Toby Green had the first word and the last word. And he also questioned Garda Kami's um, description of the occupation. He said, the occupation as you describe it, as though it didn't actually exist. And when we wrote to ask why, the BBC wrote back and said, well, there are some people who dispute the occupation, including Toby Green and supporters of Israel. And that's why John Humphreys had to play devil's advocate. But actually, Toby Green was there to make the points himself. He didn't need the BBC presenter to make them for him. And equally wise... So your, qu your question yeah. is... Sorry, I'm so And sorry. my question is, um, you know, equally wise, the BBC seeing things through the eyes of the occupier. So my question is um, to both of you, the newspapers are willing to attack the BBC on many, many things. Most recently, it's failed digital strategy, Jimmy Savile, etc. Why do they never pick up on the BBC's coverage of the occupation, on how it's so entrenched almost establishment-like in its support of Israel. And the examples I gave, you know, were to give you those examples. I mean, that's news, isn't it? We're paying for this. It's license we funded. There's also taxpayers' money going to fund the World Service and people over 70 who don't have to pay a license fee. So all, you know, uh, tax money, license fee money is going in to pay for this. The newspapers don't seem interested in how it reports in Israel and Palestine. Okay. Why not? All right. Uh, and, and finally, yes. Uh, Mm. I will try. I will be short. Uh, my name's Salim Alam. I, I just wanted to ask, because um, I feel a bit like a victim in this room, as if the whole of the news coverage depends, uh, and, and how the BBC reports and what we read depends solely on whether there's a peace process or not. Or, and one of the things I'd like to ask is, what the, the panel, what can we do here? And, and there's two specific things I wanted to raise. One is, James Harding has just been appointed Head of News and Current Affairs at the BBC. And actually, we read it in a Guardian article that he said in 2011, I am pro-Israel. Uh, he said, I haven't found it too hard because the Times has been pro-Israel for, for such a long time. So here we have someone who has been appointed in the last few months who is blatantly pro-Israel and is now the head of news and current affairs, which I think means he gets control over all the main programs. So is there something specific that we should be doing on that? Uh, coming back to the point that David was raising about executive pressure on executives, is it pressure on particular executives or journalists? Um, and the second thing uh, I'd like to ask is, um, are we at a point with James Harding's appointment that we should be saying that actually, I mean, to, you, to sort of paraphrase the words of McPherson, the BBC is institutionally racist against Palestinians and the Palestinian narrative. Excuse me, there's not just one, there's three that Lord Hall has appointed. Daddy Cohen, what's the other guy, Colonel or something? James Penner. Three, three. three of them, not one. So what do we do? Right, okay. I've got, I've got the three questions, three and a half questions. Um, okay. Media fatigue on Palestine. Um, uh, is it is it because people simply don't want to know the background? It's also because the uh, the conflict itself changes. Uh, I mean, one of the things I was going to say um, when I was going to talk about the future is, in fact, the effects that Syria is having on the whole Palestinian uh, debate. Um, and the fact that uh, Hezbollah has now set itself against Hamas, for instance, that uh, Saudi is fighting Shia, um, we're going to get a lot of repercussions 
on the whole debate in, in, in Palestine. It's, it's, it's in fact going to dim it completely so that uh, media fatigue, coming back to the question, uh, is also going to be a question of this huge rolling story uh, just across the border in Syria, which is affecting not just Syria, but Lebanon and Iraq, and in fact the whole post-Ottoman uh, configuration of the borders. And I don't think we're going to hear from Israel-Palestine for a long time for that reason. Um, it isn't just simply me media fatigue. It's a question of a huge thing happening uh, which sucks the oxygen out of the initial conflict. Um, do you think that out there the general public actually have a, an interest in the background issues behind Palestine? I mean, many of us in this room do, of course, that's probably why we're here, but generally out there, do you think they care? I think the, the, the humanitarian issue, and it's a, it's a political crisis with huge humanitarian consequences. But the humanitarian issue certainly touches a nerve. And uh, the, the fact of whether they're interested in the actual conflict, I think it's down in, in part to the media. And it's up to the media to educate. Now, whether that's going to happen or not, and give the background, give some context to the issues. If you've got a, you know, a 30 second, a one minute, two minutes, to put a news item across, you know, live from the field sort of thing on the BBC or any other news channel. You, know, you haven't got time to give the historical context. And I've had this from some of the journalists themselves. They're not allowed to have that anymore. And so we're going to have to rely on uh, other journalists putting together documentaries. And I think the documentaries which come up, and even things like when you dramatise, things like The Promise, which was on Channel 4 a couple mm. of years ago, which, okay, it took a few yeah, liberties, brilliant. as if brilliant. anybody brilliant. could just go through brilliant. a tunnel and enter Gaza from Israel, you know, it doesn't <laughs> happen. But that's a small, small point. The fact is that the general picture presented was, I thought, very, very good. Yes. Um, Br 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 Brahim, you're, you know, you're bringing back another central point, which I think we've, we've kind of not covered this evening, is that this um, act of betrayal against the Arabs is the last piece of colonial mistake. It wasn't a mistake. <laughs> it's deliberate. No, I, mean, it's, I mean, it's the last thing the British did really wrong. You know, and the, you know, it's, it, they try to forget it. Um, I, 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 I want to come back to, to, to the question. I want to make sure that those questions are answered. Can I can very quickly just yes, say, what course. can we do? What can we, we do? Okay, the third question, what can we do? Write letters. <laughs> That's Give me some support. Yes. What, we, what uh, we can do. I often, I, I often write three or four letters on the same issue and send it to my friends and say, please send this in. Because yep. it's a fact mm -hmm. that for journalists, for program makers, anything, if they get a response, it shows that there's an, that there's an interest there. Yes. So whether it's a response for or against. And if you've got a, a journalist, for example, or a, a director, a, a documentary maker, who's made a, a, a program that you're not happy with, and you write in, then it's unlikely that person is going to do something again. If enough people write in, you know, their commissioning editor or whoever is paying them is not going to ask them to do another unpopular program. Conversely, if they've done something really good, we need to write in and let them know you've done a really good job on that because then it's more likely to happen again. Praise so, and criticise and equal Yeah, but it's also the fact that just generating interest, the fact that people are responding by phoning in, uh, by writing in, I, you know, this shows that the programme or the item, the news, the, whatever it's been, the article, has generated some degree of interest. And that's going to, to, to change. You know, you know, journalists are people too. Yes. The humans too. And so of course, the other thing, of course, it, it's not just letters, it's, it's social media. Yeah, Write those yeah. comments, because yeah. many times those comments go up and there's no real strong editorial control over them. So the more yeah. you put the comments up, yeah. the and more you engage. If I just raise the point about what can we do when you get people who are admittedly biased one way or the other, or with preferences one way or the other, appointed to such senior positions, the proof will be in the pudding. You know, this is the BBC's answer. Well, you know, he will be entirely impartial, etc. Well, well, we'll wait and see. But it's, it's very telling that in the wake of Cast Lead, the Israeli Foreign Ministry actually issued a directive to the Hasbara people, the propaganda people propaganda, around the world, yeah. 
you know, start placing articles, start placing programs. So they were very confident that they had the ability and the people in place to be able to do that. Now that, that to me said a lot. Uh, if, they can, if they can just basically give this directive and all these sleepers all of a sudden wake up and start, start doing things. But there are clearly people in positions of influence uh, who are able to do this. I kind of just phoned the BBC up. We're, we're, from a Muslim perspective, on, on other issues, we get told so many times, and, you know, the Muslims should be uh, denouncing you know, what happened in Woolwich a few weeks ago, you know, the, the, for example. I kind of phoned the, the, the director of, of Newsnight up and say, I want to come on the program tonight. They decide who goes on the program. Mm. So they are choosing who is representing communities. And it's the same when it comes to the Palestinian issue. It's the producers, the researchers who phone up mm -hmm. and, and they will ask half a dozen people and whoever provides the answer which is best suited to their program outline is the one who will get on. So there's a lot of... And you get stereotyped. For some reason I, I volunteered to, to make a comment um, on Abu Qatada and suddenly I was on every other week on Abu Qatada and Abu Hamza You're and that's expert. all they wanted me to talk about. You're the expert. Yeah, I was an expert. On How it. many terrorism <laughs> experts do we <laughs> see on the television? <laughs> but, but I mean, coming back, I, I thought what was quite enlightening, it was your, when you said the Guardian is a two-state solution paper, so somebody has made a policy decision no, we all have. as to the editorial control of the Guardian. No, no, we all have. It's 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 the policy of the paper. Um, but that's a, that's begging the question. The policy of the paper. Well, this is what I want to get to. So, it's well, it's the okay. It's the leader line, and and it's but, been. But, but who makes so so a whole bunch who, who a whole bunch decision? of journalists who, in the who who do have done the job and who do the job that I do, um, plus all plus plus everyone else. But does it come down from above? Is there somebody sitting up there saying? This is what we're going to we, do. We, we, officially, we, we, we represent. Sorry the voice. to put you under pressure, but we I'm no, no, no. <laughs> we, vo we, we voice the the. We are the voice of the editor, and there's only one editor, so that's that's. So it's Russ position. Bridges. Um, Absolutely. It's the voice of the New York Times. And it's the voice of the New York Times, and 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 and, and what else? That doesn't mean that I can't write leaders basically saying, well, uh, how likely. Is this a good idea? Well, yeah. or how likely is it? Mm. When you when you know when when you basically have half the Israeli cabinet at the moment denying that there should be such a thing as a Palestinian state or or whatever, and it it, it doesn't concern me. I I am much more skeptical personally about that uh, uh, policy That's option. That's very interesting. That than, you than, be than, than 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 the actual. But I'm just being honest. I'm saying you my individual view. I'm not representing the paper. That's my own position. But. Uh, you know, uh, I think that debate is healthy within a newspaper, and it's healthy uh, to talk about it. But you know, what is not healthy, is basically, is with the sort of stuff that we've been describing here, which is basically journalists responding or not responding to pressure. Can we go out back out to the? I don't know, you were the first one up, blue shirt. Uh, yes. Question or statement? I don't mind either. A brief statement. Okay. Do, Donald, well, another the line point so is the, the whole intellectual battle, well, I'd say intellectual battle of books. What I mean is, is I think that the gun on the olive branch by David Hurst, another David Hurst, an older David Hurst, published in 1977, I mean, uh, in terms of the English, perspe English language perspective, I think that was the first, like, detailed account of the Palestinian point of view. Uh, and now the point is now, in, in terms of my knowledge of reading books, but thinking back to when I was... I remember seeing the gun on the branch like in the early 80s, like in a bookshop in a library. And I think, for, for in, my, in my mind, that was the only book I was aware of. Like now, in the last decade, I mean, a bit, a bit, I've just become aware of the lots and lots of books, particularly published by Pluto Press. As they publish, uh, from my perspective, they publish huge amounts of books. And for example, in my local library now, in, in Essex, I'm saying, you know, they've got the, the, a book called The Politics of Denial. About the about the refugee question, which but the, but but the point is, I mean, I, this is the point is, is that going going back through the years and early in my life, in my local libraries, I would I don't think uh, I would only only ever have seen prose or any books because the point is from 1948 onwards, and uh, and you know the only books that you could ever get you would ever get would be would be pro putting for the pro Israeli point of view, and there's, there's a fundamental underlying kind of in, in, intellectual intellectual point behind the art what the journalists news reports do. You know. uh, and lady at the back there. 
I've always wanted to be that person that says, the lady in the glasses at the back. <laughs> um, I think it's incredibly naive to say that there's no bias in anything, because documentary makers, above all, have a bias. You know, journalists have their own personal bias, and ultimately, everyone has the internet to say what they want to say. And I, so my real question is to Ibrahim, of who do you want to read your letters then? You know, because is it the editors? Is it, and who has the agency to do anything? My, the main thing is I want people who read, the, who buy the newspapers to read the letters, anybody to read the letters. Um, what we've done since two th December 2011, which is when the last of the letters which are in the book were sent out, so from January last year, we wait two or three days n to see whether they're going to be mm. published or not, and then we put them on our website, on the Middle East Monitor website, to make sure that you know, people can at least get a chance to read them. Uh, so it's, it's there, f it's information for anybody who's interested in the issue to, to want to see a different perspective, or maybe the same perspective, and it might be sort of strengthening their own beliefs and, and views, might be giving them a bit more information that they didn't know about, for example. So it's basically for anything. I'm in the education business as well. And that, you know, to me, knowledge is, is power, it's understanding, and it's got to be good for, for people because ignorance causes a lot of problems. And so if we can get as much knowledge and education out there, information, uh, that people m make up their own minds. It's got to be a good thing. So anybody and everybody uh, would like to, to read. If the editors also read them, which I doubt, um, then that's cool if they can then change the, the editorial line. The fact that, uh, say, one or two uh, journalists have been in touch with me when I've criti criticised them. One of them, um, who was very c kind to, to contact me, and we keep in touch, but he said he, he, does, he objects to being called lots of things, but especially an Israeli stooge. And, uh, <laughs> I don't think I quite called him that, but anyway, um, I implied that's what he, that he was. And uh, it's, it's something like that. If I can make a difference with somebody by writing a letter, to them, then you know, that's, that's good. Uh, I've, I think of if I can enlighten somebody or change somebody's viewpoint or even give them a broader viewpoint, then you know, that's got to be a good thing from the, the readers and the viewers' perspective because they're going to get a better, better news and items put before them. You know, we'll draw it to a close now. So what I'm going to do is take your question and I think I'll take your question and that's it. You, you've already asked the question. So if I just go for you two. Um, so. I think we're leaving out the American side of this. Uh, I'm James Thacker. I represent an index on censorship of the release of Mordecai Venunu in 2004. Um, when I went through the IDF checks at the border, I was carrying, I was the mule. I had Chris Mitchell's tapes for that illegal interview in my suitcase. Uh, because I was American, they took the case of the, 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 the tapes out, looked at them, and put them back in my suitcase. And I got through. Chris went through the next night with some more tapes. And he was interrogated. Uh, the BBC was thrown out of Israel as a result of this. Um, but I don't think it's so, quite so uh, simple as you're describing it. I think the, the censorship is much more ferocious. When they released that on the BBC, that interview, uh, there was no prediction. There was no programming. Friends of ours in Index and all the human rights groups had no knowledge of when it was going. It went on a Sunday afternoon, and it was never broadcast again, as far as I know. There was a huge investment involved in that. That's what they banned them for. Um, I think they're after the BBC because the BBC is the only uh, world organization. I mean, Al Jazeera is taking over from it. It's the only one that is still trusted, the USIA. The American organ is in the hands of the CIA, and everybody knows this. Uh, so I think the Israelis are really very concerned about the BBC for that reason. Uh, they don't give a damn about Israel, uh, what the Europeans think politically about anything they say. Look what the Europeans did to us. They're really worried about America. And I mean, in answer to the question, what do we do, uh, you have to be very brave. Tony Judd, who made a huge stand in New York, uh, was, really had his life destroyed by the lobbies. Uh, but Ken Roth, who reported citizen cam you know, casualties in the second Israeli invasion of Lebanon, uh, went right to the top of the AIPAC list along with Carter. And you know, when I asked him what he thought of that, he said he loved it. He loved all the notoriety. I think you have to have a lot of balls, actually, to get her to, to, to do this. A really thick skin. And you need an organization if you can have one. I mean, Alan Rusbridger's opinions, uh, they say, uh, even his opinions don't, uh, don't know they belong to him. Um, I think the, the Guardian is attached to the New York Times and is not showing an awful lot of courage in all of this. Has a whole range of opinions. Uh, but the BBC, I still think, does have credibility, and I think that credibility should be defended. There was one. Well, I, did, I totally disagree. 
I, I think that, no, I, well, well, if I come to this gentleman here, then I'll, I'll leave it back to the panel for final comments. Is that is that? Uh, Thank uh, you. My, my name is Paul Scott. I have a, uh, a, well, a statement and a question. We communication is about message and audience. So, in the writing these letters, Ibrahim has had a audiences both to the journalists and editors themselves and to the reading public. Now, but you, Richard, you mentioned the comments and social media. So I've got Mark. a question. Oh, Mark, sorry. Sorry, sorry. I have a question that, to David. Now, we have the online Guardian comment is free. Lots of scuffles going on there whenever there's an article about Israel-Palestine. Lots, you can lose yourself on there for hours sometimes. There's even the Zionist organization there, Sifwatch, obviously. Now, is what goes on there just the audience, is that the public, or is it also monitored by the Guardian editors, journalists? Is there, are we, you know, what, what is the, what is being going on, going on there? Is it, in, is it the same import as letters, or is it just, you know, ephemeral comments that are just gone? Should I, Tim, do you want to come back on the BBC, then you can come back on the Guardian, and then we'll leave the last words to you. I'm going to say something very simple to you about the BBC. The BBC is the most powerful news organization in the world at the moment. There's no question about it. The Guardian, with all due respect to David Hurst, you know, has what? 500,000, 600? How many, how many people online? Uh, well, online now, it's, it's the it's sixth. Huge, yes. It's huge. Yeah, it is massive. Absolutely anyway, huge. No, anyway. it's, it's okay. like, it's, it's so like you completely blown me apart. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, but the Week BBC is, is but the BBC <laughs> with its online. It, it's the most powerful news of it. It's influential, and what it's doing on Israel Palestine is wrong. Mm. It's absolutely wrong. Yeah. They get it wrong all the time, and they do it deliberately. And it's not the reporters on the ground. It's the way the news is managed. Now, when I used to work for the BBC, and there's an old friend of mine sitting in the corner there who used to do the same thing. We reported what we liked. David Sells reported what he liked. I reported what I liked. You know, I mean, uh, you know, you had to be factual. It's changed. It changed in 2000 when the Israeli lobby went to work, when BICOM came in to work. And it's pressuring, and we've heard it from The Guardian. You know, if The Guardian is being pressured, can you imagine the BBC, which is a which is a governmental institution? I mean, you've seen it. You've seen it. I mean, uh, you know, they pull. I mean, the most. I mean, the most obvious example was the other day when they pulled this program, archaeology, it was pulled out of the. I mean, I think what your point is that, yeah. that you can praise that, that, that there's a lot to praise the BBC for, and and there is something, and it's not all lost. Uh, um, but during the Soviet period, there were KGB agents in the World Service. People fight over the BBC. You've got to, you're loaded with spies. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's, it's not just well, we had Georgi Markov, who was killed on World War. <laughs> can, can we come back to the Guardian and and, and your very small website? <laughs> 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 I'm sorry it's about that, David. No, 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 sorry. <laughs> it's, 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 it's my it's, my website's bigger than your website. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's. Uh, it's very heavily edited, uh, and we have put a huge amount of effort into just trying to make the thread, uh, you know, civilized and um, you know to the point and not mutually insulting uh, at all. And so we have a we have a we have, we now have a whole book of uh, rules to to to, to, to monitor what uh, what's been going on sometimes. Um, when I write a leader, which is also um, which also becomes a blog as well, we restrict the comments on it because we know the whole thing is just going to go 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 crazy. Um, so it, it, it is very difficult, and it just requires a, just a huge amount of effort, just just to make sure that that decent points of view are put across. Um, I was going to say something else, I've forgotten. If you, if you think about it, let me know. Okay. I want to come back to, to, to Eva. But I'm really fine, Eva. I'm just to bring things together. Oh, really. Yeah, I remember what I was going to Oh, you know what it was? Yeah, right. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I, I'd just like to leave with, with one thought because this is, you could interpret this as being an extremely gloomy meeting with two sort of representatives of the press here saying, 
you know, we're fighting a losing battle, but I don't think we are. I, I think, actually, uh, the truth is coming across. Uh, I, I, I am optimistic about public opinion in Britain, for instance, not because it's anti-Israeli, but because it just doesn't accept the sort of consensus. Um, the consensus w w w be, w w w which is being daily driven down our throats by politicians that who, are, who, who, who sort of monitor what they actually think about them and self-censor. And I actually think that it, it, it's, you know, with all the, the huge amount of force, you know, it, it, it broadcasting or journalism has become an act of force, an act of force on us, on the, on, on the writers and on the journalists. I don't think it's working. I think that, you know, it's, this is me being ridiculously optimistic, but I think the truth will out. Ibrahim, to you. I think that's, Last word. that is, is exactly it. And one of the, th the great things I'm very happy that we're sitting here in London, not somewhere in the Middle East, is that we're having this sort of discussion. Because it's, it's like it or not, we've still got a very vibrant media here. And, and we can push. And the, the fact that we can challenge and, and, and write letters, in the, no matter how eccentric, um, this is an important aspect of, of being here in, in part and parcel. And that's the fact that the media, I mean, The Guardian, allows things like Danny Dion's piece the other day, was it the, 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 uh, the Deputy guy Defence Minister, yeah. No, there's somebody else then. There was somebody else about the, the settlement. Yeah. Yeah. About the spoken for Yeshiva, the settlement. Yeah, the right. the, yeah. The, you know, I mean, t to me, you can say, well, comment is free, but facts are sacred. But, you know, the, the facts in there are, are totally incorrect. So should he be allowed to do that? Well, yeah, he should be allowed to do that. And I think that's part and parcel of this whole exciting thing that we're in, into this, this whole media. And I, I'm very optimistic because I have seen a sea change. As it says, since 1988, I've been involved with this and, and challenging the media and, and checking the media. And we, we do see things now which you wouldn't have seen then. And uh, I think there's, there's great hope for the future in that sense. And from a, I mean, f with another hat on, you know, um, on the charity side, we, we see people across communities supporting the humanitarian situation there and they speak to us and tell us that you know they're not happy the, 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 you know, Tim mentioned it before they're not happy with the way things are done and so I think change will come about because at the end of the day the media has to represent what people want it to represent otherwise it's not going to be there thank you could well, I, could I, well, could, could I, I, just, I just wanted to add something you've got, you've got five seconds okay <laughs> <laughs> the editor of the Guardian who said comments are free and facts are sacred was the biggest Zionist yeah. that ever lived. Yeah. There you go, right. there's a note to finish on. Right, well, can I, can I, can I, can I, can I, yes, it was. Can I, can I uh, thank uh, all our speakers, well, thank you for coming along this yeah. evening and, par and participating in the debate and discussion, and also thank our speakers as well, in the usual way, um, my Thank you. Uh, before